He would just appear at their bedside in the middle of the night. Women, single women home alone. He would tie them up, cover their faces so that he couldn't be seen. He was like a cat, and he was in and out in a very short order. A sexual predator is on the loose. Can DNA science help police unmask the unknown rapist before he strikes again? Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. In the last decade, DNA has become a major crime-fighting tool. One scientist has even called it God's gift to forensic science. But let's go back to a time before this mighty tool was in the forensic arsenal. In 1989, a young woman is sexually assaulted in Barrie, Ontario, about an hour outside of Toronto. The detective who arrives comforts the hysterical woman and hears her gut-wrenching story of how the rapist attacked her while she was sleeping. How he did unspeakable things to her. In her bedroom, a forensic identification officer bags items to test for any possible clues as to the rapist's identity. The woman says she was forced to wear a blindfold even when she showered, so she never saw the rapist's face. But on the floor by her bed, the police find a man's wallet. The wallet belongs to a Michael Giroux, Michael Giroux is a professional photographer in the Barrie area. He owns a small studio called the Kiss Hut, which specializes in wedding photos. The boy next door. I mean, he's the type of guy that you would probably take him to the corner store and have a beer with him. I mean, he was just a, that type of guy, polite. Uh, please, thank you, no thanks, I appreciate it. But no, I mean, he was a likable kind of guy. Michael Giroux tells the police that his wallet was stolen days before the rape. But under further questioning, he breaks down. He confesses that after having a painful argument with his former girlfriend, Annie, he'd gone for a walk. He passed a window, glanced inside, and saw a girl lying naked. And he just lost it. He tells the police he's devastated by what he's done. He's afraid that this one stupid mistake will ruin his life. As a matter of procedure, the police ask him for a saliva sample. If he recants his confession, they may need this sample to compare to evidence collected at the crime scene. This happened in 1989, the year forensic DNA was first introduced in England. Canada, like the rest of the world, was still using the less discriminating ABO system. The ABO system could only classify biological fluids, saliva, semen, mucus, into one of four major blood types, A, B, AB, and O. But Giroux's saliva doesn't play a role in his trial, since he pleads guilty to raping the Barry Ontario woman. He indicated to his honor that that this was a one-time thing. He didn't know what had come over him. He didn't know why he had done it, but he did it, and he was very apologetic, and it wouldn't happen again. Michael Giroux is sentenced to three years in prison. While he's in prison, 
his house in Barry is sold. When the new owners clean out the basement, they find what looks like an old ashtray. This is the exact ashtray that was found at, at one of the residences that the offender lived at. And when the people were cleaning it up, they found in the basement, just thought it was an old ashtray. So they went to grab it, realized that the lid came off it. So they had a look inside, and inside they found a uh, wallet that was all duct taped together. And inside the wallet were several pieces of identification. The IDs belong mainly to women and a few men. But whose are they? And why are they in Giroux's basement? In the following months, investigators locate the owners of the IDs. Most live in Toronto's High Park area. A few have been victims of break and enters. But one particular story catches the detective's attention. Her name is Lucy James. When the detective shows her her old driver's license, she breaks down. She explains that her ID was stolen eight years ago by a man who sexually assaulted her. She had been doing the laundry. He was hiding in her bedroom. He held scissors to her neck, blindfolded her, and in a soft Irish accent whispered he wouldn't hurt her if she did exactly what he wanted. Then she heard him snapping photographs of her. After raping her, he made her take a bath. At the time, the police had collected Lucy's sheets and robe to test for biological clues, but the ABO blood type system couldn't help identify the unknown assailant. When the rapist left, he had taken Lucy's driver's license, the same driver's license found in Giroux's ashtray eight years later. Investigators find out that the assault on Lucy James was only one of a series of rapes committed during the 1980s by an assailant the police dubbed the High Park Rapist. Since serial rapists frequently live near the area of their attacks, investigators note that Michael Giroux lived in the High Park area from 1983 to 1986. They also find out that during those years, more than half a dozen rapes occurred within a 10-block radius of Giroux's apartment. Weighed against these facts, investigators learned that Giroux was living with his girlfriend Annie during this period. He doesn't have an Irish accent. And even after he moved to Barrie, the High Park rapes continued. In fact, as recently as 1990, a French nanny was raped in her High Park apartment. Is Michael Giroux a cunning serial rapist? Or is he, as he claims, a regular guy who just lost it one night and made a single stupid mistake? And if Giroux isn't the High Park rapist, who is? By late 1992, detectives are zeroing in on Michael Giroux as a serial rapist, possibly the High Park rapist. Then unexpectedly, he is released from prison to a halfway house in nearby Hamilton, Ontario, having served less than nine months of his three-year sentence for rape. Investigators put him under surveillance. But Giroux is Mr. Normal. He is out looking for work and has a new girlfriend. Meanwhile, the police continue to re-interview the High Park rape survivors. Woman after woman tells a strikingly similar story about the unknown intruder. He would uh, just appear at their bedside in the middle of the night. Women, single women, home alone, in the same geographical area, in one particular instance in the High Park area. Um, he would tie them up. In some instances, he took photographs, or what they believe were photographs being taken of them. Uh, he would always uh, usually cover their, their faces so that he couldn't be seen. Uh, he was like a cat. He just sat upon them very quiet, didn't hear a thing, and he was in and out in a very short order. And the stories were pretty much the same through each and every instance. 
And one final piece of the High Park Rapists' M.O. Following many of the rapes, the women were forced to bathe in order to wash away any evidence of the rapist's biological fluids. By 1993, Toronto's Center of Forensic Sciences has established a formidable DNA lab. What is amazing about DNA, from a forensic point of view, is that with the exception of identical twins, no two people have the same DNA. And each person's DNA is found in every body cell and in every cell of their bodily fluids. But the first challenge in seeing whether DNA can help solve this case is to see if any of the biological samples still exist from the old sexual assaults. Most of these cases occurred when DNA didn't even exist at the Center of Forensic Sciences. So people might not have thought about DNA and was anything retained? Was there a vaginal swab in a freezer somewhere at the Center of Forensic Sciences or with the police that we could test? A semen-stained garment, did it still exist in a case somewhere, maybe in a police locker? And now we have the ability to test these things with DNA. Can we find items that we can test? As the police search storage facilities, detectives get a call from a social worker at Giroux's halfway house. She is concerned about Giroux's attitude towards women and cites the result of his phallometric test, a mandatory test administered to convicted sex offenders. The test involves wiring the offender to a piece of equipment. Photographs and videos of graphic violence and child pornography are shown on a screen, and a device records the offender's sexual response. Michael Giroux fails the test miserably. He claims that the reason he failed is that he has a mild epileptic condition similar to Tourette's syndrome, but it is never substantiated. Investigators also receive records from as far away as Florida that Giroux has been convicted of 10 peeping tom offenses in the past. Rapists often start out as peeping toms. Though police are zeroing in on Giroux as the possible High Park rapist, they still lack proof, physical proof that can nail him to at least one of the High Park rapes. And the clock is ticking. In less than a week, Michael Giroux is scheduled to be released from the halfway house back into the general public. They deemed him to be a very high risk for recidivism, in other words, to reoffend. That's when investigators learn that since they'd called off the surveillance, a rash of B&Es have been reported in a nearby Hamilton high-rise. Their records show that 10 years before, Giroux worked in the high-rise as a superintendent, and investigators suspect he retained a master key. Based on reports of stolen goods in Giroux's possession, Giroux is arrested and charged. The police seal his room until they can obtain a search warrant. And Giroux is sent back to prison to await trial. Then comes a big break. When the police locate Giroux's former girlfriend, Annie, she tells them that when she was living with Giroux, she came across a briefcase full of photos of naked women, some in bondage. And there were also revealing photos of her taken from outside her basement apartment before she even met Giroux. They had a major fight about it, and she took back the photos. But afterwards, she could never shake the creepy feeling that Giroux stalked her before becoming her boyfriend. Investigators now obtain a search warrant for Giroux's room. We went to the scene uh, and we started at 9 a.m. in the morning. We had a time limit of midnight that night. Uh, the room itself was only 10 feet by 12 feet but to collect every piece of evidence, record every piece of evidence, takes hours and hours and is very meticulous because you have to record it inch by inch. Because they must be so meticulous, it is only at the 11th hour that they find a briefcase stashed in the closet. In it are negatives, a couple of eight millimeter videotapes, and two small blue notebooks. 
Will this cache give investigators the proof they need? To coordinate the data now coming in from Barrie, Hamilton, and Toronto's High Park, a sexual assault task force is formed. They immediately contact DNA specialist Wayne Murray. I got involved uh, through a request from Metro Sexual Assault Squad to take a look at a person named Michael Giroux uh, as being a serial rapist, potentially Hamilton rapist, Barry rapist, High Park rapist. And we started with a set of some 30 to 33 cases and said, could Michael Giroux be uh, responsible for these and can we use DNA to answer the question as to whether or not he is? Exhibit A, the amazing science of DNA. Will the samples from any of these 33 sexual assaults match up with Michael Giroux's DNA? Police suspect Michael Giroux, a one-time convicted rapist, may in fact be a serial rapist. Currently, they have him in prison on break and enter charges. But what investigators desperately need is proof that connects Giroux to one of their unsolved rapes. Items from 33 unsolved rapes have been submitted for DNA testing. 15 are found to have DNA samples suitable for testing. Now these need to be compared with known samples of Giroux's DNA. The lab receives Giroux's saliva sample from the 1989 Berry rape and a pair of his semen stained shorts. Meanwhile, investigators are carefully examining the contents of the briefcase found in Giroux's room. The two small blue notebooks contain pages of lists of items stolen from apartments in the Hamilton High Rise. Other pages list various women by name, address, marital status, and rate their attractiveness on a scale of one to 10. The notebooks were taken back to our laboratory where I submitted them to a chemical analysis. And the chemical uh, develops fingerprints because there's a reaction between the amino acids and the chemical. And you can see the, the purple. The fingerprint belongs to Michael Giroux. The eight millimeter videotapes found in Giroux's briefcase, it turns out, were from a hidden camera he had mounted in the women's change room at his photo studio, the Kiss Hut. More telling are the stacks of negatives. On one strip of negatives, there are transparencies of the photos Michael Giroux admitted taking of his former girlfriend, Annie, before they met. Further on, there are photos of other women in various stages of undress. On a second strip of negatives, there are photos of Lucy James, the victim of the 1984 High Park rape. Some are voyeuristic shots taken days before the rape, but the last photos are actually taken during the rape itself. Careful examination reveals that the two strips were originally part of one strip. Someone cut them apart with scissors. But in the lab, these two strips are placed alongside one another, and they match perfectly. I took the strips of film, and physically, first I matched up the numbers of the frame, and then I put the two strips together, and you can actually see the characteristics of the cut matching. And then, of course, you can see the frame numbers sequentially progressing along. In the end, that cut-up strip of negatives proves that the person who admitted photographing Annie also raped Lucy James. That person is Michael Giroux. The DNA lab also comes up with results. Michael Giroux's DNA is consistent with four of the 15 samples suitable for testing. Though Giroux was handsome and had girlfriends, rape is not about sexual starvation. It's about power and control. While Giroux may have looked like the boy next door, he was, in fact, a full-time systematic sexual predator. Giroux was nocturnal. 
he would prowl his neighborhood between midnight and seven in the morning. He would stalk women. He would peep in their windows and photograph them. He would study the locks on their doors with the intention of cutting his own key. Then he would plan and commit the rape. He would also photograph the women so he could relive the thrill later. In fact, being a professional photographer, he used special 1000 ASA film that didn't need a flash. Afterwards, he made the women wash to get rid of any of his biological fluids. Giroux would often steal jewelry or a camera, but what he really stole from these women was their souls, their peace of mind, their present and future happiness. Prosecutors suspect Michael Giroux committed dozens of rapes in Barrie, Hamilton, and Toronto's High Park. They only have ironclad evidence of four. But rather than risk a dangerous offender charge, Giroux pleads guilty to the rapes and is sentenced to 25 years in jail. In a strange and unique twist, the DNA testing in this case not only proved Giroux was a serial rapist, but caught two other serial High Park rapists one of whom police can now prove committed the 1990 rape of the French nanny. But what about the survivors of these sexual assaults? Some say they haven't had a relationship since they've been raped. Others live alone, forever in fear. Some still choose to keep their terrible secrets to themselves. None is unscarred. I'm very protective of all the women that I deal with and men that I deal with in this particular field. And so it's difficult for me uh, to really talk about it because it's stirring everything up again. Because there were a lot of a lot of people hurt by this by this individual, and it just it, it stirs up the memories. The stories on Exhibit A are based on true cases. The forensic scientists and investigators are the actual individuals who worked on the cases. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the guilty are real.